All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Peter Conti Brown. I'm an assistant professor here at the Wharton School, and it's my special honor to introduce our wonderful guest. Uh, Binya Applebaum is, as of this year, on the Times editorial board, and for the decade prior, was on the beat that I watch most closely, which is in the business economics and especially the Federal Reserve, where he was a distinguished journalist uh, covering uh, everything you can imagine around finance, financial regulation, and monetary policy. Perhaps the most important of Binya's distinguished uh, characteristics is that he, of course, is a Penn alumnus. So we're very happy to have him back. He'll be speaking to us about his book, the Economist Hour. He'll give a lecture on that book, present to you his uh, main arguments and findings, and he'll turn it over to us for a Q&A. Without further ado, ado, I introduce you then, Binny Applebaum. Hi, good evening. It's always nice to be back on campus. Uh, always new buildings when I come here. It's a little confusing, but uh, nice to see. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, my book, The Economist's Hour, um, which is a history of a, a revolution that began in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, uh, where economists began to gain uh, new influence over policymaking in the United States to assert uh, a really profound degree of influence over the course of, in particular, domestic economic policy to reshape the way that the government manages the economy, interacts with the economy, regulates the economy. Uh, it's a story about uh, how that happened and why that happened uh, and the consequences uh, for all of us. Um, I often begin the story by talking about what came before the Economist's Hour, which I find interesting and, to me at least, was surprising. Uh, until the late 1960s and the early 1970s, economists didn't play a particularly large role uh, in American public life. Uh, I begin the book actually with the story of a young economist sitting at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the early 1950s, working uh, as essentially a human calculator. His job was to prepare numbers for the people who actually made decisions. The leaders of the Fed at that time did not include any economists. They were financial market types, uh, an Iowa hog farmer, uh, some bankers, uh, but no economists. And indeed, the man who ran the Fed at that time, William McChesney Martin, told the visitor that the Fed had a few economists, but they kept them in the basement uh, because they asked good questions, but they didn't know their own limitations. And so Volcker goes home one night and he tells his wife that he doesn't see a future for himself at the Fed. Uh, he can't imagine, uh, I just gave away the ending of the story, but this guy, Paul Volcker, uh, goes home and, and tells his wife that he doesn't see a future at the Fed. He can't imagine making a career there. There's no, they don't have a use for economists. Uh, and uh, so he's going to go off into the private sector, which he briefly does. Uh, but by the end of the 1970s, he's running the Federal Reserve. Uh, and uh, from then until the financial crisis, and indeed for some time after the crisis, it remains essentially an institution run by economists, uh, staffed by economists, controlled by economists. Uh, the Fed is an institution most of us are not surprised to think of as, as run by economists, but economists actually spread out throughout the federal government. Uh, one of the first places that they impact federal policy, which I still find fascinating, uh, is that in, from after World War II until the early 1970s, the American military annually conscripted uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of young men to fill the ranks of the Army in particular. They were able to get enough people to volunteer for the Navy and the Air Force, but for the Army, they had to go out and grab them. Um, and they did this you know, simply by deciding that you, know, you and you and you would need to serve in the military for a couple of years. Uh, the Vietnam War made this very unpopular, um, but it didn't end the system. What ended the system is that Richard Nixon was convinced by economists, notably Milton Friedman, uh, that military conscription was inefficient that it would be better to pay people to serve in the military as much as a market wage was needed to convince them to serve. Um, the argument in part was that when you drafted people, you ended up having Sergeant Elvis Presley serving in the army rather than singing, and that wasn't good for anyone. And what you should do instead is let him go sing and pay someone else to serve in his place. Uh, that person was more likely to stay in the army, could be trained to use complicated weapons and systems, uh, would remain in the army so you didn't need to train their replacement just two years later. Uh, and this would produce a much more efficient armed force. Uh, 
Uh, and Nixon found this argument persuasive. He, in fact, embraces it even before conscription becomes really unpopular during the heart of the Vietnam War. Uh, he pushes it through Congress, uh, and he ends military conscription in 1973. The last, there's always a last guy, so there's a last guy who's conscripted, and he serves about 16 months, and then told a reporter for the New York Times that he hated every minute of it, and that was the end of military conscription right up to the present day. Um, that was Milton Friedman's first great victory in the realm of public policy, and to the end of his life, he considered it his most satisfying. Friedman uh, was a household name for a while, maybe he still is, I don't know, I haven't done a survey, but he was easily the most important economist in 20th century America. His influence on our lives was profound and far-reaching. He was a child of the Great Depression, uh, but unlike many of his peers, he didn't come out of the Great Depression believing in the importance of government efforts to combat poverty or economic disruptions, quite the opposite. His conclusion was that government should get out of the way. And for a long time, he was a voice in the wilderness preaching these ideas. But what happens is that the decades of prosperity after World War II begin to break down by the late 1960s. So you've got what's still remembered as something of an economic golden age for about 30 years. The French actually call it the three glorious decades, although it sounds much better in French. And they uh, are grinding to a close by the late 60s or the early 70s. There's a sense that the activist hands-on approach to management that had prevailed in the decades after World War II is no longer working, uh, and that something new needs to be tried. Uh, there's a woman named Juanita Kreps who serves as the Commerce Secretary in the Carter administration. She was also a professor of economics at Duke University. Uh, and in the late 1970s, she leaves the administration because she says she has despaired of its ability to manage the American economy. And she also steps down as a professor at Duke University because she says that she doesn't know what to teach her students anymore. And that's where economics is by the late 1970s. There's such a profound loss of faith in its understanding of the economy uh, that, you know, a leading academic has essentially thrown up her hands and surrendered. And it is into that void that a new kind of economist uh, represented by Milton Friedman, but also many of his peers, walk into the room and basically say to policymakers, we have an alternative. Um, their alternative was particularly appealing because of its modesty. They didn't say, we can manage the economy. They didn't say, we should replace the people who are now in charge. They said, no one should manage the economy. Uh, markets should be allowed to allocate resources. Government should step back and get out of the way. We should reduce taxation, reduce, at that time, to take an easy example of this, the federal government licensed trucks to carry goods across state lines. If you wanted to transport undeveloped film, you needed a federal license from a board of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. If you wanted to transport that same roll of film after it was exposed, you needed a different license from the same board of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. In one famous case, a company that transported tomatoes from California to Tennessee appealed for a license to return on the same trucks the frozen pizzas that were produced at the plant where it carried the tomatoes, and it was denied. Uh, the government would not allow it to carry the frozen pizzas back to California. And that was the nature of economic regulation. That's how it worked. The government made those decisions. Uh, and it was against that system that Friedman uh, and his allies warred ultimately successfully uh, in the 1970s to convince policymakers that they should step back and allow the economy um, to operate uh, more freely, freely from government regulation. Uh, I'm fascinated by this revolution because I think that many people today are basically unaware that it happened. They don't know uh, how little power economists used to have uh, they may not entirely understand how much power economists came to have over economic policy. Uh, and, and to me, uh, the third leg of this is the consequences of that power. Uh, because the premise of economists' involvement in the economy was that they would deliver a return to prosperity and that that prosperity would be broad, that Americans generally would benefit. Uh, it wouldn't just be the case that, that some would benefit, but that all of us would see our boats rising. Um, and that didn't happen. Uh, the economy actually grew more slowly, measured on a per capita basis, in every decade from the 1960s through the current decade. We may get a little bit ahead of the aughts, but only because it's a pretty bad comp. Um, and, and furthermore, inequality skyrocketed. The share of the gains that went to a very small portion of the population grew 
uh, massively, and for many Americans, their economic status stagnated. Uh, uh, that obviously is a story that has many causes. Uh, the spread of manufacturing more evenly across the face of the globe uh, is certainly a big part of that story. Uh, but I think that one big factor, and one that doesn't get told often enough, is that the government stopped trying to combat inequality. It stopped trying to uh, address, to ensure the equality of opportunity, to address the distribution of gains. Economists argued very convincingly, and very importantly, that there was a trade-off between equality and efficiency. Um, that if you tried to ensure a broad distribution of gains, it would come at the cost of economic growth. And that policymakers, therefore, should focus on making as large a pie as possible, not worrying so much about how the pieces were cut up afterwards. Um, and the result of that uh, is that those pieces uh, ended up being cut in a very unfair manner. And a few people ended up with very large pieces, and most Americans did not. Uh, that rise of inequality was also held to be inconsequential. Economists argued that it didn't really matter if the distribution of income was unequal. What mattered was absolute poverty. And if you could eradicate absolute poverty, it didn't really matter if some people had relatively more than others. Well, we've been conducting a natural experiment on inequality for these last few decades. We've acquired a great deal of data at an enormous cost. And we've learned to our sorrow that inequality actually is important in many ways as an economic force. Uh, it actually mimics poverty to a considerable extent. People. Uh, who are disadvantaged, relatively speaking, experience that disadvantage in the same way as absolute poverty. Um, we've learned that it impedes economic growth. The International Monetary Fund, which spent decades advocating for these types of economic policies, now concludes and advises that inequality itself weighs on economic growth, which is a remarkable reversal, of course. Um, and the last element of this fabric of consequences is the impact on democracy. Uh, we have seen uh, real strains on our ability to govern ourselves in recent decades. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the most important reasons that that is true uh, is that the very idea of we the people is being strained, that we have less and less in common as a result of these widening, yawning inequalities. And as a consequence, it's harder for us to act in our collective interest because it's harder to define our collective interest. And that, too, is a consequence of this economist's hour. Uh, of this emphasis on inequality. To see all of this playing out, one area in which I think it's really helpful uh, to sort of take as an example uh, is the movement that was called the Law and Economics Movement, uh, which was an organized effort to uh, reinterpret American law uh, through the lens of economics. Uh, and it played out with particular power in the realm of antitrust policy. So antitrust law began in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as, uh, as an effort to constrain the emerging power of large corporations. The idea was basically that uh, big companies were a threat to democracy and to a particular way of life, to a vision of America in which everyone had at least the possibility of becoming economically self-sufficient, owning their own business, their own farm. Um, and the idea was that the rise of companies like Standard Oil directly jeopardized that vision of America, and therefore that they should be constrained not because they were inefficient, not because they were bad for the economy in some aggregate sense, but because the specific consequences of having such a large company was bad for uh, democracy uh, and for individual economic freedom. Um, there's a moment uh, in the debate about the first, the Sherman Antitrust Act, where a member of Congress actually stands on the floor, one of the bill's managers, and says, even if it's true that Standard Oil can deliver kerosene to every American household more cheaply than its rivals, that's not good enough. That's not our goal. What we want uh, is to constrain that company, even if it means kerosene is more expensive. And that was the prevailing approach to antitrust enforcement for the first half of the 20th century. Uh, it was not managed by economists. The Supreme Court, in a famous case in the early 1960s, writes that it doesn't want to consider economic evidence in antitrust cases. Uh, it says that it doesn't have the competence to consider it, which is a nice way of saying it's not you, it's me. Um, and, and that uh, prevails as, as the American approach to antitrust law until uh, this same period, this economist's hour, when economists primarily affiliated with the University of Chicago begin to argue successfully that antitrust policy should be rethought. 
the most important person uh, in this movement is a man named Aaron Director, who happens to be Milton Friedman's brother-in-law, and also one of the first economists to serve on the faculty of an American law school at the University of Chicago. And Director has this vision of the corporate landscape in which companies are so busy trying to survive that they don't have time to prey on their customers. He just doesn't think it happens. He thinks that for any given example of corporate conduct, you can and should be able to find a reasonable explanation. One of the first places that he attempts this is he convinced one of his graduate students to go back to the record of, of the Standard Oil case in which the federal government broke up Standard Oil uh, and examine what it was that Standard Oil was doing wrong. And sure enough, the student finds what director wants, which is that according to director and this student, Standard Oil was simply a more efficient company. It wasn't preying on its competitors, it was out competing them. It was bringing benefits to consumers. And they published this in a journal funded by the University of Chicago. Some of you may recall that the University of Chicago was created with Standard Oil money. So you now have the phenomenon of the University of Chicago defending its founder. Um, and this article essentially launches a new approach to antitrust law by arguing that companies are actually behaving in a way that's good uh, for, for society and that they've been misunderstood. Uh, and indeed, that law in general should be reoriented. So the guy who wrote that, early, that opinion in the early 1960s was a Supreme Court clerk named Richard Posner. Um, and he uh, goes on to become one of our most distinguished and important jurists. Never quite made it back to the Supreme Court, but uh, perhaps our most important jurist in the late 20th century who didn't. Uh, and he argues in his writing that, that the meaning of justice is actually economic efficiency. That's how we should understand what justice itself is. And that this should be applied, and in areas where the law does not produce the most economically efficient outcome, the law should be changed in order to produce that outcome. But most of the time, in his judgment, it already does. And so what you get in antitrust law is a new standard in which antitrust cases are measured in terms of whether you end up with lower prices. That's the whole goal. Are consumer prices lower at the end of the day? Anything else you don't need to worry about. Uh, concerns about democracy, about the corporate, the political power of large corporations, about the survival of small business, about the possibility that a worker who no longer has as many employment options is not going to be able to negotiate uh, with as much leverage for their compensation. All of this is set aside in favor of an overriding focus on uh, you know, getting prices as low as possible. And prices do fall. Uh, you can look at, say, the beer industry, where there were dozens of brewers in the mid-century. The government actively prohibited them from merging. Uh, but that didn't really work. A uh, few large brewers essentially just kept building and building new breweries and closing the old ones. And you end up with two large brewing companies. And in terms of the amount of work required to purchase a sick pack, it's been in steady decline for you know, the last 50 years. Um, but what has happened at the same time, of course, uh, is that workers in that industry don't make as much money. There's less competition for their services. Um, in other industries, you see reduced spending on innovation and research. Uh, you see the consequences of this corporate concentration uh, really weighing on economic growth across the economy. Uh, and that ends up being the story of, of a revolution that went too far. Um, and I think that that is the broader narrative here. There were significant problems in the 1960s and the 1970s that economists were enormously influential in addressing and enormously successful in addressing. Uh, but the revolution went too far. It lost sight of uh, its own shortcomings, uh, and it was purified to the point where uh, it began to do more harm than good. And that uh, is where we find ourselves now. Appreciate it.